There we go. All right, thank you very much. Okay, welcome everybody uh, to the, the first of this year's CCCBA DEI town hall programs um, on the murder of Vincent Chin, a trial reenactment. Um, I, my name is Teresa Hurley and the executive director of the Contra Costa County Bar Association. It is wonderful to have you all here. Um, I would like to say a big thank you to our DEI sponsors. They are the ones who are enabling us to put this program on for free to everybody who wants to attend. Um, they have supported us in, in all of our DEI programming this year, so we're very appreciative of them. Uh, I am going to now throw this to Jonathan Lee, who uh, was the, the mastermind behind this program, and uh, he is going to take you through to um, learn a little bit of history before we go into the, the trial reenactment. Jonathan. Thank you, Teresa, and welcome everyone to this very special presentation by the DEI Town Hall Subcommittee of the Contra Costa County Bar Association. Tonight, our emphasis will be the murder of Vincent Chin and the resulting state and federal criminal proceedings that gave rise to a civil rights movement by Asian Americans. We wanna start with two quick notes before we turn to those events. First, um, our committee notes that the term Asian American encompasses a rich mosaic of different histories and cultural heritages among those who self-identify by that term. Uh, recently, the Census Bureau published updated statistics showing that 25 million Americans identify as Asian American. Among these, the largest groups in number were in order, Chinese American, Asian Indian American, Filipino American, Vietnamese American, Korean American, and Japanese American. And there were uh, at least two dozen other groups listed in the statistics, which we will make available to you for your interest. A full discussion of the experiences of each of these aspects of the Asian American experience uh, is beyond our scope tonight. So that's number one. But we want to acknowledge it as we are celebrating Asian American Pacific Islander heritage this month. Second, we want to tell the story of what happened to Vincent Chin, but we also want to set it in a broader historical context as we have done with other historical programs, such as last fall's Port Chicago program. Uh, we do this to help all of us gain a more complete understanding of our nation's history. And this also helps us to understand current events as well. So to trace the historical roots of anti-Asian violence in this country, we go back to the mid 19th century. This was a time when uh, Western aggression brought the uh, opium trade to China, uh, which caused a lot of internal strife and social disruption. Uh, the United States was not a belligerent uh, in the opium wars that took place in the mid-1800s, mid but we were an active trader of opium, uh, even in defiance of Chinese laws prohibiting it. Uh, unsurprisingly, this highly addictive narcotic uh, wreaked havoc on China making living conditions in parts of the country unbearable. And some Chinese sought economic opportunities elsewhere, including on the Pacific coast of North America. Also during the 1840s, uh, the Pacific coast of the United States was experiencing an economic boom with the discovery of gold in California and the annexation of California, as well as uh, most of Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico at the end of the Mexican war. The expansion of the United States and the discovery of gold led to a population explosion in the West with the need for people to work as laborers in farming, mining, and on infrastructure projects. The number of people of Asian descent in the United States grew exponentially during this period. As you can see from the slide on the screen, uh, the estimated number of Asian residents in the United States in 1840 was four. 10 years later, it had grown uh, a thousand fold. And then 10 years later grew, and you can see there at 40,000, and then grew to 65,000 in 1870. One of the infrastructure projects uh, that uh, you've probably heard about was the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, it is estimated that ethnic Chinese made up 80% of the workforce on the Western side of that project, which was very difficult and dangerous work indeed. Hostility towards Asian Americans in the Pacific United States. Uh, during this time, we're talking primarily about immigrants from China. 
uh, became open and often violent. Uh, this took the form of discriminatory laws and practices. Again, a thorough discussion of this is well beyond the scope of what we're going to do tonight. But as an overview, here are several that were important in Northern California and throughout the Pacific states and territories during this period. Uh, discriminatory taxation, these were uh, taxes that were only levied on uh, Chinese residents in Northern California. So the mining tax uh, required only the Chinese miners to pay a monthly tax in order to be able to mine. The commutation tax was a, was a tax imposed on the shipping companies. Uh, if you brought a passenger from Asia, you had to pay a special tax. The companies passed that through to the passengers. So the Chinese passengers paid more to get here as a result of paying that commutation tax. And the Chinese police tax required Chinese residents of San Francisco and other municipalities to pay uh, a tax per capita uh, for the protection of the police. The second item listed there, the no right to bear witness, it was decided uh, here in California that um, persons of Asian descent could not give sworn testimony, uh, also could not serve as jurors in a trial. So with violence happening out of the mine sites and other places against um, Chinese immigrants, uh, it often was impossible for anyone to prove that a crime had occurred because the only witnesses would be um, Chinese immigrants who could not uh, provide testimony. Uh, the sundown rules applied to many of the different cities and municipalities here in our area, and they just simply uh, required that persons of Asian descent could not be on the street or outside of their homes after sundown. Chinese workers were paid at very low rates in general, uh, which made uh, employers uh, view them as a source of manual labor that could be used to bust strikes or generally just reduce labor costs. So through this exploitation by unions and other employers, uh, the uh, objections and outright hostility of other workers became a real feature of the time. The rhetoric of this time included uh, warnings of you know, hordes of workers who would swarm into the country like an invasion and displace American workers, language that sadly we have heard uh, even in recent times. So when there was an economic down cycle uh, and fewer jobs were available in general for all workers, this dynamic was exacerbated. Uh, such a time was the panic of 1873 which was a major crisis in this country at the time and touched off a depression here and in Europe. The anti-Asian rhetoric became more charged and inflamed as newspapers across California carried editorials that sparked violence against ethnic Chinese residents. And that's why we turn now to a local chapter here in Contra Costa County. Uh, we're gonna talk about events that happened in Antioch, California here in our own county. And what you see now is a map uh, showing uh, Antioch in the 1870s. And the area traced in yellow is where the Chinatown was located at that particular point in time. In 1876, a mob of Caucasians expelled all the Chinese residents of Antioch. For the preceding 25 years, Antioch was a so-called sundown town in which Chinese residents were barred from walking city streets after sunset. To commute to their jobs and homes, Chinese residents of Antioch dug a series of secret tunnels between the business district and their homes. There was tension and hostility uh, simmering just below the surface in Antioch during these years. And an excuse for ridding Antioch of the Chinese came on April the 29th, 1876, when the town's doctor disclosed publicly that a handful of young Caucasian men he treated had contracted venereal disease. Uh, the uh, local populace uh, blamed the Chinese women who lived in the town, and a mob quickly formed, and talks of murdering the women came up. Uh, it was uh, a mob descended on Chinatown, telling the occupants that they had to leave by 3 p.m. that afternoon. So young and old, healthy or otherwise, uh, the Chinese residents of Antioch had only hours to pack up and leave, and they... Uh, the newspaper articles described that they went to the local dock for ferries uh, with all of the belongings that they could carry as soon as they could get there and ferries uh, left for either San Francisco or Stockton. The following day, a Sunday, uh, rumors circulated that some of the Chinese residents had returned to Chinatown and by 8 p.m. that night, 
uh, the Antioch Chinatown was ablaze. On May the 2nd, 1876, the Sac Sacramento Bee described these events as follows. You can see there's the actual uh, print from the newspaper. And I'll just quote it for you in case you can't see it. The Caucasians of Antioch in Contra Costa County have a short way of getting rid of the Chinese evil. Medical men discovered that the Chinese were propagating disease. In a day or two after that discovery, all that remained of Chinatown was a heap of ashes. Antioch now has no Chinese or Chinatown. The Caucasian torch lighted the way of the heathen out of the wilderness. The Contra Costa Gazette, a newspaper here in Contra Costa County had similar reporting. Um, and you can see here, uh, I'll just give you these three excerpts just to make sure in case you can't see the text for some reason. This is a longer article, but three excerpts. The first one says 35 or 40 citizens proceeded to the Chinese dens and notified them to leave town before three o'clock or trouble would ensue. And then later it says, among those who left by riverboat was one woman who was nearly gone with disease. The boss Chinaman was sent with them, but much against his will. And then later in the article, it says, by the next night, Chinatown was on fire. All the two of the buildings were destroyed. The inmates fleeing, terror stricken. Antioch is now free of this disreputable class. So the incident in Antioch is just one among many, unfortunately, uh, during a period that became known as the driving out. Mob violence against Chinese immigrants occurred all across the West and all across California in particular. In uh, 1871 in Los Angeles, a mob looted Chinatown after the shooting of a white man by a Chinese man and the mob lynched 19 Chinese residents. In 1877 in San Francisco, Unemployed uh, white workers gathered for a meeting and began attacking Chinese immigrants. They killed four of them in three days of rioting, blaming them for economic woes. In other parts of the West, uh, for example, in 1885 in Rock Springs, Wyoming, 28 uh, Chinese miners were killed. In Tacoma, Washington, all of the residents were expelled. Uh, in Eureka and Humboldt County, uh, Chinese residents were expelled after the shooting of a Eureka councilman. And the list goes on and on. There were um, expulsions, lootings, arsons uh, that raised Chinatowns to the ground all across California in the 1880s in Arroyo Grande, Marysville, Merced, Pasadena, Redding, Red Bluff, Riverside, Truckee, Tulare, Chico, Fresno, San Jose, Fresno again, Riverside, and Redlands. And there are more. And on the screen before you and in the materials that we're gonna make available, there's actually an online and interactive map where you can go and put your cursor over any one of those blue dots that you see, and you'll get a description of what happened there. And you can see there are many, many dots in California, but they're spread across the entire West. So in 1879, California passed a constitution that included Article 19. It was titled Chinese. Uh, the constitution of this state prohibited the employment of Chinese people by state and local governments as well as by businesses, which were incorporated in California. It also delegated to uh, the power to remove Chinese people to the local governments of California. This was not repealed until the early 1950s. There were several pieces of federal legislation during this period that limited immigration of persons of Asian descent, culminating in the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, which was passed into law almost exactly 100 years before the murder of Vincent Chin. The Chinese Exclusion Act prohibited Chinese immigration into this country for 10 years. Uh, the act came before the Supreme Court in three cases in the 1880s called the Chinese Exclusion Act cases. And it was upheld as constitutional, which established something called the plenary power doctrine, providing that the executive and legislative branch have near total power to regulate immigration, including in a manner that would be considered discriminatory if the same rule applied against a US citizen and the judicial branch has limited oversight. But we still live with the plenary power doctrine today. The act itself was later extended uh, to 1902 when it was made permanent. And it was not until 1943 with the Magnuson Act that it was repealed. And uh, a new system was allowed for the limited uh, immigration of Chinese into this country 
a quota set at approximately 105 as of 1943. That limit was raised in 1952 and then was abolished in 1965 by the Immigration and Naturalization Act, including the quotas that applied to other persons of age. It's important to our story to understand that the Immigration, excuse me, the Exclusion Act of 1882 and these other federal legislative enactments we've been discussing that restricted immigration were greeted with mass celebrations in this country. In the 20th century, California continued to pass laws that discriminated against persons of Asian descent. And here are a few of those. The Alien Land Law of 1913 uh, prohibited Asian immigrants from land ownership. Uh, that was amended in 1920 and 23 to prohibit the leasing or ownership of land by American-born children of Asian immigrants or by corporations controlled by Asian immigrants. And anti-miscegenation laws or laws that prohibited the intermarriage of people of different races, first passed in this state in 1850, were amended in 1905 to explicitly cover persons of Asian descent. That uh, particular law was not uh, repealed by the legislature, but was stricken down uh, in a court case in 1948. Now, the 20th century, obviously, there's beyond the scope of our program to do a deep dive on the 20th century, but no discussion of the 20th century could, could uh, take place in this area without uh, discussion of Executive Order 9066. President Roosevelt signed this executive order in February 1942. And in the following six months, over 100,000 men, women, and children of Japanese ancestry were moved to assembly centers and then confined in isolated and guarded internment camps. I just have to say that this last week, we lost Norman Mineta at age 90. And as a boy, uh, reading some of the obituaries, I was struck by this story. Um, as, a, as a boy, uh, Mr. Mineta was interned with his family. And on the day he was removed from the community in San Jose, he wore his Cub Scout uniform and carried his baseball bat and gloves. And the soldiers took the bat away from him as a potential weapon. Um, Mineta later rose uh, in government to become a 10 term congressman and cabinet official under Presidents Clinton and Bush, a true American hero. There is much more to tell about the 20th century, a part of our story, but I'll mention just two more items here. There's a there's a consistent thread of discrimination against Chinese American scientists uh, through the Cold War years and beyond, most recently the case of Wen Ho Lee, which resulted in a, a, a federal judge explaining that the highest levels of our government should be issuing an apology. And of course, the death of the murder of Vincent Chin in 1982, uh, which sparked the civil rights movement, as you'll hear more about later. And in the first quarter of this, the 21st century, uh, these threads of history have continued. I did want to mention that the city of Antioch issued an apology last year, and that several other Western cities who experienced similar events issued similar apologies. But at the same time, we have seen a spike in hate crimes against Asian Americans in this country, and we have some statistics to share with you. For the years 2019 to 2020, according to the FBI, and this is the most recent data set from the FBI that's available, there was a 77% increase in hate crimes against Asian Americans. So essentially it doubled from one year to the next or nearly doubled. According to the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at Cal State San Bernardino, uh, in years 2020 to 2021, uh, there was a 342% increase in hate crimes against Asian Americans. Uh, part of it is that the center, as I understand it, defines hate crime uh, slightly differently than the FBI, but still it is an extreme spike in hate crimes. And the highest uh, amounts of hate crimes occurred in Los Angeles, and second highest was New York City. In summary, the murder of Vincent Chin did not happen in a vacuum or as an isolated, uh, one-off kind of tragedy. But rather, it is uh, one very sad chapter of a long-running story in our nation's history. It's one that our committee hopes you will contemplate as you go about your daily lives with increased awareness. Before we get to the heart of our program, we do want to say thank you to the Asian American Bar Association of New York uh, for the use of the script tonight and to the jury group uh, for the use of the visuals tonight. So with that, let's turn to the rest of our program now. Good 
This much is certain. On June 19, 1982, just outside Detroit, Vincent Chin, 27 years old, Chinese ancestry, a working class American citizen engaged to be married the next week, went out with friends for a bachelor's party. At a strip club, they encountered two men, Ronald Ebbins and his stepson, Michael Nitz. There was an altercation. It continued outside. Sometime later, and a few blocks away, Nitz held Chin down as Ebbins swung a baseball bat. The bridegroom's head was split open. Blood, spinal fluid, and cerebral matter pooled onto the pavement beneath him as he collapsed into a coma. Chin died four days later. In state court, Ebbins and Nitz faced criminal charges. They accepted a plea bargain. At the sentencing, the prosecutors failed to appear. Judge Charles Kaufman imposed on each man three years probation, a $3,000 fine, and court costs. Everything else is disputed. There would be two federal criminal trials, a protest movement, and more publicity than had ever been devoted to any incident involving an Asian American. Yet the context, the causes, the consequences of the Vincent Chin case all have been the subject of great controversy. Although the Vincent Chin case has ceased to be infamous, for Asian Americans, it has never stopped being iconic. The Vincent Chin case is very much a part of our legacy as Asian Americans. Today, we will explore that legacy by reenacting portions of the court proceedings for you, drawing from the transcripts and court decisions. The words you will hear are the actual words with minor editing for length. You will hear the use of explicit language as part of the reenactment. And these are the actual words used in the court proceedings. We begin with the sentencing in Wayne County Circuit Court on March 16, 1983. Evans and Nitz were charged with second degree murder, but the prosecutors offered a plea bargain to manslaughter. Both men accepted with Evans pleading guilty and Nitz no contest. At sentencing, both men were represented by counsel. As was common at the time, because of the high volume of cases and lack of resources in Wayne County, no prosecutor appeared, nor were the victim's family and friends notified. Defense lawyer Bruce Saperstein spoke on behalf of Evans and argued that Chin was the instigator. Dave, have you unmuted yourself? Okay, here we go. Uh, Your Honor, but for the physical assault by the victim in this case, the victim initiating the physical assault, this crime would never have been committed. Mr. Evans and Mr. Nitz were seated and the victim walked up and punched Mr. Evans in the mouth. During the scuffle, Mr. Nitz had his head cut open, was bleeding profusely, and in fact required stitches. Either side, Your Honor, could have been the victim in this case. They could have changed places in this particular case. I think Your Honor would agree in looking at the background and the background of Mr. Evans is impeccable. That Mr. Evans is not a, a hyenas criminal. I don't believe that rehabilitation is even in order in this case. I'm confident this would never have happened and would never happen again. And God knows that these gentlemen would like to see this man back, but we can't change what happened here. With respect to punishment, Your Honor, Mr. Evans is being punished every day of his life over this incident. He can't change that. He has to live with that. His work background is excellent. 17 years at Chrysler. Mr. Evans, uh, do you wish to say anything? Only that I'm deeply sorry about what happened. If, if there is any way I could change it, I sure would. I was looking to see if there was any background on the victim. Do you have any background on him? Did the victim have a criminal record? I don't have any background on him either way, Your Honor. It is the judgment of this court that each of the defendants be placed on probation for a period of three years. 
In addition, I will require I will require that each of you pay two hundred and sixty dollars a year costs at a rate of twenty five dollars per month. That each of you pay an additional fine in the amount of three thousand dollars at a rate of one hundred dollars per month. I will leave the question of restitution to civil proceedings. Judge Kaufman did not explain his reasoning for imposing a sentence of probation, but months later, in an interview, he stated that. These weren't the kind of men you send to jail. You don't make the punishment fit the crime. You make the punishment fit the criminal. Traditionally, Asian Americans had believed that they should not make waves, and Asian Americans had always been reluctant to discuss race. Most Asian Americans did not know the language of civil rights, and in the early 1980s, the subject of race was largely black and white. The Asian American community, however, was galvanized by the notion that a Chinese American could be beaten to death because of his race, with his killers sentenced only to probation and a fine. The two men were white auto workers in Detroit. One was out of work at a time when the U.S. auto industry was under tremendous pressure from Japanese imports. Detroit in 1982 was perhaps the hardest place in America to be Asian American. You were the face of the enemy. Anti-Japanese sentiment was at its height. There was taunting, violence, and public displays, including scenes of politicians and union leaders demolishing Japanese imports, that Jap crap, with sledgehammers. It was against this setting that Asian Americans found cause to speak up. For the first time, Asian Americans crossed ethnic and socioeconomic lines to join together to seek justice for Vincent Chin. Led by, among others, attorney Liza Chan, journalist Helen Zia, and Vincent's mother, Lily Chin, a number of Asian Americans formed American Citizens for Justice. Their efforts to publicize the case were remarkably successful. The extensive publicity was virtually unanimous in its criticism of the sentence the judge, the prosecutors, and the two defendants. The case was described as an outrage, the product of racism. In June, 1983, Liza Chan, Lily Chin, and others met with the Justice Department in Washington, DC to urge the government to bring federal criminal civil rights charges against Evans and Nitz. Because of ACJ's efforts, the Justice Department received thousands of letters and signatures on petitions urging it to prosecute Ebbins and Nitz. In November, 1983, a federal grand jury in Detroit indicted Ebbins and Nitz for interfering with Chin's right to use and enjoy a place of public accommodation, the Fancy Pants Lounge, on account of his race and conspiracy to do the same. The case was assigned to Judge Anna Diggs Taylor, one of the first African-American women to be appointed to any federal court in the country. The case was extensively litigated with numerous pretrial motions, including a motion to dismiss the indictments on the grounds the federal civil rights law in question applied only to blacks and that orientals, who were considered by many to be white, were not protected. There was also a motion to change venue because of the adverse pretrial publicity. Both motions were denied. Trial commenced on June 5th, 1984. It was undisputed that Evans and Nitz killed Vincent Chin, but there was a sharp dispute over the issue of motivation. The government had to prove Evans and Nitz acted because of Chin's race. We turn now to the opening statements from United States versus Ronald Evans and Michael Nitz, the first of the two federal trials. Theodore Merritt from the Justice Department opened for the government, while defense attorney David Lawson spoke for Evans. May it please the court, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. The evidence will show that on June 19th, 1982, a brutal crime was committed on the streets in Highland Park. On that night, the defendant, Ronald Evans, helped by his co-defendant, Michael Nitz, repeatedly beat with a baseball bat, a Chinese American citizen of the United States by the name of Vincent Chin. And they beat him so bad that he died four days later from massive head injuries. 
And the evidence will prove that Vincent Chin died at the hands of these defendants because he was a Chinese American and because he was enjoying the entertainment of a public bar. The evidence will show that this fatal assault was preceded an hour or so earlier by a confrontation at the bar between Vincent Chin and the, the defendants. The confrontation was caused by Ronald Eben's barrage of obscenities, baiting, and racial insults directed at Vincent Chin. What happened in Highland Park that night was a story of ugly racism, which turned violent. Now, the burden is on the government to prove not only that Ronald Evans and Michael Nitz were responsible for the death of Vincent Chin, but to show that they killed Vincent Chin because of his race and with the intent to deny his right to use the Fancy Pants Lounge. Now, we do not believe that the evidence will prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Evans acted because of Vincent Chin's <laughs> race. We believe the evidence will show that this was not a civil rights case, but a fight between angry and intoxicated men that ended in the death of one of them. Lawson gave Evans' version of the altercation. He also attacked the government's witnesses and suggested the issue of race was a fabrication. The witnesses will tell you that Evans was in an outrage and he began swinging the bat at Vincent Chin. The bat struck Mr. Chin several times, including the head, the neck, and other parts of his body. Mr. Chin fell in the street with a mortal wound to his head, and he died four days later. As a result, Ronald Evans was charged with murder. He pleaded guilty in the Wayne County Circuit Court to manslaughter. Then something happens in that court on March 16, 1983, which set off a chain of events which has resulted in this trial today. And that was that Ron Evans got probation for killing Vincent Chin. Naturally, such a sentence in a case such as this upset and enraged Mr. Chin's family and friends, and also members of the community. And you will hear evidence that after the sentence of probation, Mr. Chin's friends and others met and tried to come up with some evidence that would turn this homicide into a federal matter. We expect that the government will try every opportunity to inject some evidence of racial sayings or racial acts into the case. Because of the massive publicity in this case, because of the influence placed on the witnesses, because of the strong beliefs held by some members of the community that there was evidence to support the government's charges, we expect that the testimony of witnesses will be distorted or changed to support the government's charges. One of the most important witnesses was Racine Caldwell, one of the dancers at the Fancy Pants Lounge. As one of the jurors revealed in a post-trial interview, Caldwell was seen as a neutral witness who had no reason to lie. Her testimony was critical on the issue of motivation. Where are you employed, Ms. Caldwell? Fancy pants. Now, Ms. Caldwell, let me ask you to direct your attention to the night of June 19th, 1982. Were you working at the Fancy Pants? Yes, I was. And did you see Vincent Chin in the Fancy Pants that night? That evening, yes. And, and what was his mood when you saw him? He was laughing and joking. Uh, now, um, did you dance that night? Yes, I did. And did you see Vincent and his friends while you were dancing? Yes, I did. Uh, by the way, how, how long did you dance anyway? Mm, approximately 12 minutes. And, and when you were up on stage, how was Vincent acting? Happy and laughing. <laughs> now, what did you do after you finished dancing? Well, I got off the stage and went back to the freshen up in the dressing room. Then I came back out to um, talk to the customers. 
Did anything happen while you were out there talking to the customers? Yes, I came close to a couple of people that was loud talking, like arguing. And I turned around and I seen Vincent and a couple of people arguing. And do you see the man in the courtroom today you saw arguing with Vincent? Yes. Can you point him out if you can? He has on the blue shirt, blue tie, and light, light blue shirt. Okay. Uh, blue let's... suit, I'm sorry. He has on the blue suit, blue tie, and light blue shirt. Let the record reflect, Your Honor, that the witness is pointing to Defendant Ebbins. And um, what did you hear Defendant say? All I heard him say when I turned around is, it's because of you little motherfuckers that we're out of work. After you heard that, uh, what else did you hear? Vincent came back with a remark like, I'm not a little motherfucker. And then it was stated to him, well, I'm not sure if you're a big one or a little one. And by that time, he got mad. Who, who said that to Vincent? That gentleman over there. Again, Your Honor, let the record reflect the witnesses pointing to defendant Ebbins. Did you hear Vincent make any comments directed at the defendant? No, other than I'm not a little motherfucker. Did he ever call the defendant anything? Not that I heard. In what tone, of, <laughs> excuse me, in what tone of voice was the defendant talking to Vincent? A loud tone of voice. And then what happened? He pushed him on the shoulder, you know, kind of hard and pushed him down. And then they got into a fight and the younger fellow jumped into it and started helping him. Who was that? That's that gentleman that started helping the older man when he started hitting Vince. And did you subsequently learn his name? Yes, Michael Nitz. David Lawson cross-examined for Mr. Evans. Now, Mr. Evans was speaking in a loud tone of voice. Like an argument, like if I was arguing with somebody, like if I was arguing with somebody. Was he shouting? Yes, I could hear him over the music. Now, when he was shouting, what did you hear him shout? Because of you little motherfucker, we're out of work. And then Vincent responded? I'm not a little motherfucker. Okay. Now, when you were making the rounds and talking to customers, is that part of the business also? Yes. And were you soliciting customers? No, I was not. Well, were you asking them if they wanted a lap dance? No. Vincent was a friend of yours? A customer. Not like a personal friend, no. But you liked him? Yes. And you liked to see him come in? Yes. Another important witness was Jimmy Choi. He and two other of Vincent's friends, Gary Koivu and Bob Sorosky, were celebrating with Vincent that night. On direct examination, Choi described the events leading up to the bachelor party and then testified about the encounter with Evans and Nitz. Mr. Choi, how loud was the music on the stage? It was not blasting like, but it was just the volume was normal. So you could carry on a conversation with the person next to you? Yes, Gary. 
And, and what about the people who were across the stage from you? Could you hear what they were saying in the conversation? No, I didn't pay too much attention at first. Then after a while, I heard a few things. What did you hear and where did that come from? I was in the bar for about 15, 20 minutes. Then I heard someone mention foreign cars from across the stage. I didn't pay too much attention. I just glanced around and resumed talking to Gary. Did you hear anything else coming from that side of the stage? Then I heard Vincent say something first, okay? He, he was talking across the stage. And did he hear any other statements from the men again across the stage? Yes. I heard the word nips calling toward our direction. And I recall Vincent saying that we're not Japanese. So uh, that is what you refer to when you understood them to mean? I understood it to be slang for Japanese. Now, when you looked over and you saw, well, well, did you see who was making the statements? Yes. Do you see him in the courtroom? Yes. Can you point him out? Yes. Again, Your Honor, let the record reflect. The witness is pointing to Defendant Evans. May the record, re go ahead. Yes. Now, when you looked over, was he looking over on your side of the table when he said nips? Yes, across in our direction. Did there come a time when you heard some more words exchanged across the table? Yes. I heard Vincent say in a loud voice, don't call me a motherfucker. I am not a motherfucker. And then what? Then I heard the gentleman say, big fucker, little fucker, we're all fuckers. What happened after he made that statement? Vincent kept on saying, don't call me a motherfucker. Then he got mad and said, come on, let's go outside. And what did Vincent do? He came around the stage and went over to where the two gentlemen were sitting. The man with the gray hair stood and Vincent punched him. Then what happened? Then they started exchanging blows. Choi continued to describe the scuffling in the bar and then he moved on to what happened outside. And what did they do? They just went to the car, lifted up the hatchback and pulled out a baseball bat. Did you see which one got the baseball bat? The man there. Again, Your Honor, let the record reflect the witnesses pointing to defendant Evans. The man you identified as Mr. Evans? Yes. And what did he do when he got the baseball bat? He, he started in a, well, not a run, something like a trot, holding the bat like this. And Vincent said, I am not going to fight you with a baseball bat. Then they kept on coming. So Vincent ran away from them. And they pursued Vincent? Yes, they did. Choi explained that Evans and Nitz were unable to catch Chin. They returned and asked the other two members of their group, Gary Koivu and Bob Swarovski, where is your friend? Choi testified that when Evans and Nitz saw him, they said, let's get this little fucker. At that point, Choi ran away as well. He eventually found Vincent and the two stopped at a parking lot in front of a McDonald's. We continue with Choi's direct testimony. Then what happened? Well, we were still sitting. Then all of a sudden, I heard Vincent say, scram. I turned around and I saw the two men right behind us, three to five steps. And what did you do? Well, I scram. I ran towards north of McDonald's right off the bat. How far did you run? 30 yards. 
Then I turned back. What did you see? I saw Vincent running across, just about getting to the median of the cars. Then the younger man came up and tried to grab him from behind, pull him around. Then they were scuffling and the older man came with the bat. And what did you see when he approached Vincent with the bat? He approached, Vincent was still trying to get away from him. And then the older man, he could not run too fast. He kind of hobbled. He took a swing at Vincent's knees. Then what happened? At that point, on the knees, one swing, upper section on Vincent, and then he blocked like this. And then what happened? What, what did you see Vincent doing? Well, he, he was going down slowly like this, and the old man took a swing right at his head. What did you do? I don't know. It was like, I couldn't believe it. I was going, I cannot believe it. And what else did you see? It seemed like slow motion. Vincent was going down. Then I saw another blow. Then he was kind of in a crawling position like this. And then it was in a frenzy like while he was swinging. He was saying something which I could not hear. He kept mumbling. How many times did you see him swing that bat? The first blow, I saw it very vividly. And where did that blow land? Right here. Indicating your honor the right side of the head. And after that? One more blow to the head while Vincent was going down. He kept swinging, and I don't know whether it was connecting or not, but I could not believe it. What did you do? Well, I ran back. I just ran toward the direction right to Vincent. What did you see when you got there? All of a sudden, I saw guns, service guns. And then I stopped abruptly and I saw a black man holding the gun. He pulled out a badge like that and told the older man to drop his bat. Now, when you went over to Vincent, was he conscious? He was still conscious. Was he saying anything? Yes. I cradled his head and I said, hey, Vincent, are you all right? And he was saying, fight, fight. It is not fair. Was he speaking Chinese? In Chinese. <clears throat> and, and then what did you do? I said, somebody get a bloody ambulance. I didn't see anyone move. So I ran inside McDonald's and I called the ambulance. Then did you go back outside? Yes, I ran straight to Vincent. Was he still conscious? He was still conscious. And then I said, okay, Vincent. I shook his hand. Snap up, snap up, snap up. The ambulance will be right here. I was holding his hand all that time. Did you travel with him in the ambulance? Yes, I did. And did you say anything to the defendants before you got into the ambulance? Yes. I saw them talking to the police officers saying something like, I didn't mean to hurt this boy. And he said, my son is hurt. I was totally outraged. I said, if I had a gun, I would shoot you both right here. And then 
you got in the ambulance? Yes. One of the defense counsel's principal themes on cross-examination was that Choi had been unduly influenced by others. Choi and other witnesses had met as a group before trial with Liza Chan, the attorney who helped form American Citizens for Justice. Chan met with the witnesses to prepare them for their testimony. The meetings were recorded and the recordings were transcribed. Defense counsel wanted to introduce the recordings into evidence to show that the witnesses colluded to come up with evidence that race was a motivating factor. The government objected to the tapes as hearsay. Judge Taylor sustained the objection, although she permitted defense counsel to confront a witness with his own words on the tape, but only his own words. She ruled that Liza Chan's statements to the witnesses could be introduced only through her and only if she were called to the stand. Frank Eamon, one of Evans' attorneys, cross-examined Choi. Well, you've been asked a lot of questions by a lot of people before coming to court today. Yes. And one of those people was Liza Chen. Yes. Now, you met with several <laughs> people about what happened at the Fancy Pants Lounge, and that included the meeting with Liza Chen in April, another meeting with the FBI in May, and with Liza Chen again in May. Do you remember those meetings? Yes, I do. And you knew at each of those meetings that the FBI was investigating a civil rights violation. Exactly. And you knew, did you not, that the investigation was not about whether those men did what they did? Objection, Your Honor. Mr. Choi does not know what the point of the investigation was. His question has no foundation. It goes to the witness's state of mind. Overruled. Now, you knew, did you not, that the investigation was whether these men were motivated in doing this act because of your friend's race? I object. Again, Your Honor, Mr. Choi did not know what the investigation was, and the investigation did not have any particular aim in its course. Mr. Choi may answer the question. This is cross-examination. Did you know that? I had a vague idea. A vague idea? Yes. Sir, you knew that it was significant whether any racial remarks were made inside the fancy pants. Did you know the significance of that? I knew the significance, but I did tell the truth. Choi acknowledged that he did not recall using racial terms when he had spoken earlier to Liza Chan and the FBI. In trying to explain why not, Choi echoed certain familiar themes. Asian Americans do not make waves. Asians do not complain of discrimination. And Asians do not use race as an excuse. And can you explain then, when you met with Liza Chan in April, why you did not tell her that you heard the word nip? Okay, because that was when the prosecution at the state level, okay, ended. I was in Toronto for my internship. I got back and didn't know what happened. And all of a sudden, this lady lawyer came to me. I was not prepared, not as much as I wanted to be. And I don't ever mention discrimination. I don't ever want to mention discrimination. And she was going for the criminal portion of the case. She didn't ask me about discrimination. And I thought, and as I thought about it, more things popped up for me. So since April of 1983, the more you thought about it, the more these remarks have popped up? It depends. It, it all depends on what has popped up in my memory. All of a sudden, little things, a few little things come back to me. Well, let me just clear it up, if I might. When you met with Liza Chan in April of 1983, you knew that that was after these men were sentenced to probation. I knew that, yes. Do you remember Liza Chan asking you, 
nobody actually heard anything. I mean, actually heard how it started, what started it. And you answering, I would believe that Evans might have made a smart ass remark. Do you remember telling her that? Yes. And I guess you're telling us today that in April of 1983, you didn't remember that the word nip had been used. Yes. Okay. Do you remember also at that interview in April of 1983 being asked by someone, uh, besides that, did they say anything like Chinaman and things like that, that type of thing, just the four letter word. And you telling them, I had not heard that. I don't think they made any racial remarks, nothing. Did you tell Niza Chan that? Yes, I did. And now when you met with the FBI agent in May, you didn't remember yet that the word nip had been used. No. Mr. Choi, am I correct that the first time you mentioned the use of the word nip was before the grand jury? Yes. And at these meetings that you had with other witnesses, do you remember with Gary Koivu and Bob Sorosky? Well, we had a meeting. Yes, we did. And you each talked about what each of you had seen and heard that evening? Yes, we did. And do you remember what you asked Gary, whether he heard you say anything about, we are not Japanese? I cannot recall. That was a year and a half ago. This is just like three conversations and everyone was talking. We were like, what do you remember? Well, do you remember that? That is the extent of the meeting. Now, some people didn't remember some things. Yes, and a few things, okay. Somebody said, okay, well, you did that. And I said, Yes, I remember that. Yes, I kind of have an idea now. Well, was the purpose of the meeting to get the stories together for this case? No, sir. Now, did you receive advice from anyone about what parts of the story to tell and what parts not to tell? I didn't receive any advice to that effect. I was advised to tell the truth and the whole truth. Don't you believe that Vincent got angry and overly reacted? I don't think he overly reacted. Didn't you tell Liza Chan that, in your opinion, he overly reacted? Will you take a look at page 11 of the transcript? Well, let me think. If I did, I made a mistake. He did not overly react. He tried to ignore any racial remarks. We tried. Uh, I'm referring right here to your transcript. Oh, did I say that? You do recall saying that then? I read it, yes. Now, at the time you said that, you were describing to Liza Chan in April events which, to the best of your memory, were completely devoid of any racial provocation. Well, there was a time okay for Chinese. We try not to, shall I say, react. Usually we can take a lot of things. There was a time when I just asked basically in the bar, how did he grab him? How did he swing the bat? And she was not really looking for racial remarks. If you go there, that it was not a very good place to go in the first place. I didn't want to do anything. Plus, I tried to shun all the racial things away from me. I had a few experiences, mostly when I deal with my classmates at school. But a few times when somebody like drives by and just told me, Chink. I just tried to brush it aside. After the government rested, the defendants put on a brief defense case. Evans chose to testify. What happened when you sat down at the bar? Sat down? I, I think I got one sip of the glass of beer 
and this black dancer was dancing. And I remember comments coming from across the stage directed at her and telling her what a crummy dancer she was, okay? Did you see who was making those comments? I really don't know who was making those comments. Uh, you know they were coming from across the stage, however. Yes. What did you do then? I don't like seeing people picked on for a starter. What did you do? I made a comment to the effect that, don't worry about those guys. Show them what a good dancer is. And did you direct those comments I, at anybody in particular? No, just the dancer. Did you say anything else? Not at the time that I remember. When you made those comments, do you recall referring to the people across the stage using the term fucker or motherfucker? I don't remember distinctly. Could you have said that? Yes, like I could have. Uh, do you or have you ever used words like that before? Many times. Is that language unusual to you? No, it isn't. And when you use those words, if you did, was it your intention to insult anyone or provoke anyone? No. What happened next? I remember at this point, the Oriental that was sitting the second from the end saying something to the man on his left, which I couldn't pick up, okay? And he got up. Okay, at that point, did you notice that he was an Oriental person? I probably did. Do you recall the testimony in this court that Vincent Chin stood up and said, don't call me a motherfucker? Yes. Do you recall hearing that in the bar that night? Not distinctly, no. Do you recall hearing it at all? No, I don't. Do you recall testimony in court that you stood up and said, big fuckers, little fuckers, we're all fuckers. Do you remember that testimony? Yes. Did you say that? I don't remember saying that, saying it. Could you have said it? Yes, I could have said it. When you saw the person say something to the other gentleman to his left, what's the next thing that happened after that? I, I really didn't pay much attention to him. I was watching the dancer. He proceeded around... And I guess the next time I was really aware of him was when I turned around and he was standing directly in front of me. What happened then? He punched me. Up to that point, did you call him or anyone else for that matter, the word chink? No. Do you recall calling anyone a nip? No. Do you recall saying anything about being out of work or words to that effect? No. Did you say any of those words? No. We move to Evans's testimony that he and Nitz were driving in their car when they saw Vincent and Jimmy Choi outside of McDonald's. All right, what happened next? And as we drove by, Michael seen him sitting out front on the steps of whatever it was out there and sitting there laughing. And it must have been real funny to them. How did you feel at this point? Angry. Why? Same reason, I guess. Uh, the man had sucker punched me and he was responsible for splitting Mike's head open. I was just angry. What did you do? I told Mike to park the car. When you got out of the car, did you have a bat with you? Yes. What did you do then? I ran around to where they were sitting and I hollered at him. And then what did you do? I said, you sons of bitches. Then what did you do? They jumped up and started to run. 
and I was on top of him and I took a swing and caught chin in the arm. You took a swing with the bat? Yes, sir. Caught him in the arm? Yes. And what happened then? I more, more or less just stopped because they took off running. What happened then? Mike came around and he caught Chin in the middle of the lane of traffic out there. And, and what did you do then? When I seen Mike scuffling, it just flashed in my mind. He's going to get hurt again. And I started toward him and something just snapped. I don't remember from there on what did happen. Did you hit Mr. Chin? Not that I remember. Were you trying to kill Mr. Chin, Mr. Evans? No. Do you remember what you were trying to do? No, I don't. What is the next thing that you remember? I remember looking up and seeing a revolver pointed at me and a man saying, drop the bat. The prosecution cross-examined. Well, Mr. Evans, you told us a lot about that night, but now you tell us that you blacked out and you can't tell us much about the beating. Is that right? That is true. Let me show you Government Exhibit 14. Is that the bat you used to kill Vincent Chin? I can't tell you that. I, I don't know. Could you show us how you were holding the bat when you asked Gary and Bob, where is your friend? I can't tell you that. I don't know. Now, when you were in the car saying, when I catch these Chinese guys, I'm going to bust their heads, you hadn't blacked out yet, right? I never said that. When you found Vincent Chin and said, there they are, you hadn't blacked out yet, right? I don't know. So only when you caught up with Vincent Chin and started swinging the bat at him, that is when you blacked out. Is that your testimony? Just prior to it. You can't remember hitting Vincent Chin in the head, so he couldn't run away? No. You don't remember hitting him in the arms? No. You can't remember hitting him in the chest, in the shoulder, in the face? No, I can't remember. You can't remember hitting him in the head as he lay there on the ground? No, I can't. You can't remember telling the police that you are sorry. But look at what they did to your son. Do you remember that, don't you? Not really. You had the presence of mind to think of an explanation, didn't you? I don't remember being asked for an explanation. Mr. Evans, if you would take this bat, maybe it would bring something back. Objection. I think we have had enough with the bat, and I think it is meant to harass the witness. Ask a question, Counselor. That wasn't a question. Yes. All right, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Evans, have you ever chased a man because of a drunken fight and beat him to death? No. Outside of this time, only Vincent Chin. And because he looked like Vincent Chin, isn't that right, Mr. Evans? No, it is not right. Lawyer summed up on June 26th, 1984, focusing on this issue of motivation. Folks, there really is only one reasonable explanation for Vincent Chin's brutal killing. In the minds of Ronald Evans and Michael Nitz, Vincent Chin was a chink who dared to stand up to them. Vincent Chin and his friends were having a good time, spending a lot of money, and that bothered Ronald Evans and Ronald Evans began a barrage of racial insults, obscenities directed at Chin's mother. He was talking about foreign cars 
And because of you motherfuckers, we in the auto industry are out of work. But ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to decide that Ronald Evans and Michael Nitz acted with any racial intent just on the basis of a few derogatory remarks. Rather, examine what they did and you will be convinced why they did it. When they walked into the Fancy Pants Lounge that night, they could only know two things about Vincent Chin, that he was an Oriental and that he was having a good time. They, of course, had never met him before. They saw an Oriental acting flamboyant, spending a lot of money. How do you think Ronald Evans reacted to that? Now, the racial animal inside Ronald Evans had been unleashed, and now his prey was anything Oriental. The brutality and the ferocity of the attack on Vincent Chin tell you that this was no mere barroom brawl that got out of hand. After Michael Nitz got Mr. Chin in a bear hug, Eben savage and repeated use of the bat, even after Chin lay motionless on the pavement, cannot be reasonably explained by mere anger or revenge. The defendants are wrong in saying that this was nothing more than some barroom fight. This was violent hatred turned loose. This was years of pent up racial hostilities and rage unleashed. This was a modern day lynching, but there was a bat instead of a rope. Defense counsel argued that the issue of race was a fabrication. How did this tragic incident become infused with race? Meetings with witnesses began to take place and into this scenario of intoxicated violence, witnesses began to inject, as Jimmy Choi says, their thoughts and ideas and images of possible racist motivations. A transformation of facts occurs because people went back to take a second look at what happened to see if they could come up with any evidence to support a second prosecution. Suddenly, when Vincent Chen said, I'm not a motherfucker, it was in response not to simply being called a motherfucker, but instead to being called a chink, a nip, to some reference about being out of work in foreign cars. What had never been a racial incident became one, and it became one gradually. That's why we have three different racial allegations by three different people surfacing at three different times. People worked hard with each other and their attorneys searching the dark recesses of their minds to find something, anything that could make this a racial event. Vincent Chin was the same as Ronald Evans, a human being. He was not a person who had only great virtues and no faults. Vincent Chin got drunk. He went to nude bars and started a fight, and then wanted to finish the fight. And Mr. Evans, like Vincent Chin, became full of rage, and Mr. Evans wanted revenge. Vincent Chin wanted to finish the fight. Does this make him a hero or a martyr? None of this happened to Vincent Chin because of his race. On June 28, 1984, the jury returned its verdict. Will the foreman please rise? Mr. Foreman, do you have a unanimous verdict for each of the counts as to each of the two defendants? We have, Your Honor. Will the clerk please read the verdict? In the case of the United States of America versus Ronald Evans and Michael Nitz, the verdict form reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant Michael Nitz not guilty as to count one and not guilty as to count two. We, the jury, find the defendant Ronald Evans not guilty as to count one and guilty as to count two. 
The jury thus found Evans guilty of violating the civil rights of Vincent Chin on account of his race. He was sentenced on September 18, 1984. After hearing from defense counsel, Judge Taylor gave Evans an opportunity to be heard. And then without elaboration, she tersely announced her sentence. Mr. Evans, is there anything you would like to say? Only your honor, I have expressed my regret and remorse on several occasions. And I would just like to reiterate that one more time. I am sorry for what happened. I can't say any more than that. At this point, I have no recourse but to, to depend on the American system of justice and you, Your Honor. Is that all? It is adjudged, Mr. Evans, that you are committed to the custody of the Attorney General for a term of 25 years. It will be recommended that you be committed to an institution where you may receive treatment for alcohol abuse. Evans appealed to the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Circuit Judge Albert J. Engel issued the court's decision on September 11th, 1986. The court addressed several issues, including Evans's argument that the federal civil rights law in question did not extend to quote unquote orientals. The court rejected this argument, holding that the statute protected any person because of his race, color, religion, or national origin from intimidation or interference in the enjoyment of public accommodations. Citing Yik Wo versus Hopkins, Judge Engel wrote, Orientals come within the broad constitutional protections of the 14th Amendment, even though the original thrust of the amendment was primarily motivated by concern for the rights of Black persons. Judge Engel also rejected the argument that Judge Taylor erred in refusing to transfer the case because of the pretrial publicity. We have carefully reviewed the extensive record made of the publicity in the case and agree that it was indeed pervasive. The nearly unanimous public judgment that Evans and his stepson should have received jail terms and the harsh criticism of the state trial judge followed by the federal prosecution of defendants based upon the same incident were bound to lead a strong public impression that justice had not been done in the state court and that it was incumbent upon the federal government to right that wrong by a second prosecution. While it probably would have been advisable for the trial judge to have ordered a change of venue, we conclude that there was not reversible error for the trial judge to proceed to impanel the jury. Ultimately, however, the Sixth Circuit held that Evans was denied a fair trial. The court concluded that Judge Taylor had erred in allowing a witness to testify about racist remarks about Blacks purportedly made by Evans some 10 years earlier. The court also strongly disapproved of what it described as inflammatory language by the prosecution in summation. The court was most troubled, however, by Judge Taylor's ruling not to allow the defense to introduce the tape recordings of the meetings Liza Chan had with the witnesses. Evans and co-defendant Nitz sought to introduce into evidence tape recordings of interviews which had been conducted by Liza Chan with these witnesses. The defense purpose was to demonstrate that the witness's testimony concerning Evans' racist statements was false and that it was a result of improper coaching of them by Chan in preparation for the trial. Each time the defendant sought to introduce the tapes, however, the court sustained the government objection on hearsay grounds. The government concedes that these rulings were erroneous. We unanimously conclude that a consideration of the relevant factors mandates reversal. Evans should have been permitted to introduce into evidence the entire contents of the tapes. The three witnesses were the most crucial of all witnesses for the government. It is true that the district court permitted the defense to elicit a few of the statements, but it was not within the province of the court's 
proper discretion to prevent the jury from hearing the tapes themselves and judging for themselves the impact upon the witnesses which the purported conversation had and measuring that against the statements made in court by the witnesses. The Court of Appeals was so troubled by what it heard on the tapes that it included as an appendix to its, to its decision excerpts from the meeting of Liza Chan and Choi, Koivu, and Sarasky on May 17, 1983. Liza Chan was only three years out of law school at the time, and she was not a litigator. She met with the witnesses as a group, and she recorded the conversations. We reenact portions of the meeting for you now. The purpose of this meeting tonight is so we can help each other remember exactly what happened, how it happened, when it happened, and all the minor details. I was talking this afternoon with the parking lot attendant, the black guy. According to his version of the facts, it's quite different from what I have so far understood them to be. So I would center on what you, the three of you, say they are and somehow try to fit all the facts around these. We will agree this is the story. This is it. When it's a federal prosecution, mm, we're all going to have to be agreeing on this is what happened. Now, if you don't agree, like you definitely remember things, certain things happen, say it's a black car and you definitely remembered it's a white car. Um, okay, other than that, let's all have it sort of down, have it down pat. Is it five minutes or is it 10 minutes? Is it more like eight minutes? Let's all agree. Otherwise you all look funny on the stand. You all supposedly were there. Is there any harm in getting too accurate because they could say, well, you all rehearse this, like if you're in court and we all have exactly the same times. As long as you're within, you know, you could say 810, you could say 820. I mean, that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm, right, but as long as they have an example. Right, but as far as the crucial facts, the crucial ones are not conflicting. I'll give you an example. Like what you people have been telling me and then what the parking lot attendant told me totally makes me completely confused. This is gonna be raising a question in the jury's mind. Well, who's telling the truth or what actually happened? Maybe nobody's to be believed. Now, I don't mean exactly everybody agree, okay? Everybody agreed at 6.30 right on the dot. Okay, mm, but I mean, you know, you can't say that we stayed at Fancy Pants for two hours and then another person says we stayed at Fancy Pants for a half an hour. I mean, that's a big discrepancy there. Right. Then, Vincent started out of the chair? Yeah. Ran over. Yeah. So that's, you remember? That's, that's why I remember just before he got up, he says, don't call me a motherfucker. I remember that. Okay. We all remember our different lines. Okay. There's no agreement that that's fine. Just remember your different lines. Right. Cheap, foreign cars, big fucker, little fucker, all fuckers. Don't call me a fucker. We all remember our lines. Okay. I'm just guessing, it's just logical, you know, I could be wrong, okay? So he said, I just don't know whether you're a big fucker or a little fucker, because he had earlier said, big fuckers, little fuckers, we're all fuckers. Maybe that's how they thought they heard that. I just don't know whether you're a big one or a little one. Right. Yeah, could be. Okay. But after I tapped Vincent and Eben said, I just don't know if you're a big or little fucker. That's when Vincent said, I told you I'm not a fucker, friend. Did anybody hear that? I didn't hear it, but you know, he's talking to him and you know, I might've saw him point out of, well, no, I can't say something like that. I think I heard him say, nobody calls me a motherfucker. I can't even say that. Mm. The record did contain other evidence that race was a motivating factor, evidence that was not tainted, even arguably, by the Liza Chan meeting. For example, Racine Caldwell, the fancy pants dancer, testified that Evans yelled at Vincent, it's because of you little motherfuckers that were out of work. Jimmy Perry, 
a bystander near the Fancy Pants Lounge testify that he was given $20 by Nitz and Ebbins to help them find, quote, two Chinese guys so they could, quote, bust their heads. And as the prosecution argued, the brutality and ferocity of the attack was proof that this was not just another barroom brawl, but an attack driven by race and bigotry. The Sixth Circuit reversed the judgment of conviction and remanded the case to Judge Taylor for a new trial. On remand, Evans renewed his motion for a change of venue because of the adverse publicity. This time, Judge Taylor granted the motion. She observed that there had been even more publicity about the case since the first trial. Most damaging of all the post-reversal coverage in the view of this court was the October 12, 1986 Detroit News Sunday Magazine cover story on the victim's mother, Lily Chen. The magazine cover was comprised of full page color photographs of the still grieving mother. The lengthy story inside accompanied by more photographs told of the tragic deterioration of her life to that of a homeless wanderer since the death of her son. The effect of this major feature alone in the newspaper of largest circulation in Michigan and Northern Ohio is extremely prejudicial to the court's ability to secure an impartial jury in this area. Moreover, the leadership of this community, including the president and members of the Detroit City Council who declared a day of mourning in honor of Vincent Chen and presented a memorial to his mother have been quoted by the news media uniformly to the effect that the defendant must be punished. Editorial comment, both broadcast and press and letters to the editor continue strenuously and unanimously to stress the fact that defendant has never been punished. Judge Taylor ordered a transfer of the case to the Southern District of Ohio, the federal court in Cincinnati. Ironically, the Asian American community's success at publicizing the injustice to Vincent Chin was a factor in causing the transfer of the case from Detroit, a city with a black majority and a history of civil rights caught in the economic woes afflicting the automotive industry to Cincinnati, a city known for its Southern sensibilities. Indeed, during jury selection in Cincinnati, only 19 of more than 200 prospective jurors said they had ever met an Asian American. In addition to the different demographics of the jury pool, the prosecution team faced several new challenges. With memories fading, its witnesses would have to testify to five-year-old events. More impeachment material existed in the form of testimony from the first trial. Evidentiary rulings that had gone the government's way the first time had been reversed. And Evans, whose selective memory had not impressed the jury when he testified in Detroit, did not take the stand in the second trial. It was no surprise then when on May 1st, 1987, the jury returned a verdict in the Cincinnati courtroom finding Ronald Evans not guilty of violating Vincent Chin's civil rights. The Cincinnati jury was not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that Evans' actions were motivated by Vincent Chin's race. Was race a factor? Evans steadfastly denied that he was motivated by Vincent Chin's race. And in post-trial interviews, he continued to deny that he was a racist. Perhaps Evans was not a hardcore overt racist, but racism is more ambiguous, complex, and subtle. Clearly, the mix of the recession, alcohol, testosterone, and tempers was a lethal combination. Perhaps Evans was not a racist in the conventional simple sense, but he may very well have been motivated by racial <laughs> impulses that he was only dimly aware of, if at all. As he put it in trying to explain his actions, something snapped and the brutality of his actions led to the death of Vincent Chin. What is the legacy of Vincent Chin? Despite the disappointment of many in the final verdict, the Vincent Chin case had a great impact both on the administration of justice in general and on the Asian American community in particular. 
The Vincent Chin case sparked a public discourse on the practice of Wayne County prosecutors not to appear for sentencing proceedings. The case showed how important it was for prosecutors to participate in sentencing and for victims and their families to be given notice of court proceedings. In the years following the Vincent Chin case, federal and state laws, including in Michigan, were enacted giving victims greater rights. And in the discussions leading to the passage of hate crime laws, the Chin case was often cited. The Vincent Chin case also highlighted the need for reform in sentencing and plea bargaining. Within a month after Judge Kaufman sentenced Evans and Nitz to probation, the Wayne County prosecutor announced a ban on manslaughter plea bargains in murder prosecutions. On the federal level, the Sentencing Reform Act was passed in 1984 in an effort to reduce disparities in sentencing. As for Asian Americans, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals held that, indeed, Asian Americans were protected by this country's civil rights laws. The murder of Vincent Chin and its aftermath awakened our civil rights consciousness. Asian Americans came together and became a community, one with a voice. For Asian Americans, the death of a man was the birth of a movement. Lily Chin, Vincent's mother, was an inspiration to many. Although she barely spoke English, she led a courageous effort to seek justice for her son. She became so disheartened, however, after the final verdict that in September 1987, she returned to her native village in Guangzhou, Canada. Sorry, China. Guangzhou, China. There, she remained until 2001, when illness forced her back to the United States for medical treatment. Lily Chin died on June 9, 2002, at the age of 82 in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Thank you everyone uh, for your kind attention to our presentation. Uh, at this time, uh, we really wanna invite um, our audience and our participants for reactions or reflections on and not only this reenactment, but uh, some of the historical uh, underpinnings that were presented earlier by Mr. Lee. Um, we would invite you to uh, raise your hands, take your little uh, Zoom reactions button and raise your hand if you'd like to share. Um, and then we can go through and um, perhaps we can ask uh, Mr. Lee to go through and moderate um, uh, any further discussion uh, that we should take in the time that we have remaining. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. I uh, do see a hand is raised. I believe it says Gary Koivu, but I think that is Renee Livingston. It is. All I wanted to say, Jonathan, is, you know, even I learned so much as a presenter in, in this um, in reenactment. But this, today was the first time that I actually heard the historical events in our own county. And it was so eye opening and shocking to me. And I just want to thank you for putting that together because, you know, we're talking about proceedings that happened in a part of the country where most of us didn't grow up. But to, to hear about it in our own county, it was just really uh, enlightening and thank you. Well, you're, you're welcome. Yeah, we've, in these programs, we've tried to uh, have a local focus as part of the program. And often we think of, um, say, civil rights violations as something that happens somewhere else by some other people. And it really is more of a universal um, problem in this country that's uh, happened all over the place. We just may not be aware of, of those events. And the Port Chicago uh, disaster and mutant trial is another perfect example of that. So you're welcome. And when I went to find the newspaper articles, it was pretty jarring to actually read, um, read it in print. Uh, it really was jarring. Does anyone know if the, if the last two buildings are still standing in Antioch and whether or not there's any plaque or any kind of information about that there? Uh, there is, um, you can see when you, when you Google like Antioch apology, um, you'll see articles that uh, discuss certain areas of the city where there are information boards or small plaques that try to tell the story. There's also down at the waterfront, there's an area where you can see uh, pilings of um, uh, foundations of buildings that once existed. And it's my understanding that those are the former residential areas um, that the the you know, Chinese uh, residents were living over the water, basically. And that area was raised and burned to the ground. And the 
the commercial district where the businesses were located is a couple of blocks inland. I, I believe there are some markers down in all, in all of those areas. Thank you. Well, we did have, um, I don't see any other hands raised. We, we had some discussion questions that we uh, wanted to share with you. We're actually gonna push this out to you. If you registered, you'll get these. And these are questions that um, we're hoping that you can reflect on uh, even after tonight. And we're also gonna share with you a bibliography of some materials. Uh, some of them are, um, uh, like there's various websites. The a website of the American Citizens for Justice is linked there. Uh, I commend that to you. It's still a very vibrant and active organization. <clears throat> um, there are some different articles. Uh, one article in particular we wanted to bring to your attention uh, and uh, Dorothy found this and thank you so much for forwarding it. So this is an article that uh, discusses uh, the work of two documentary filmmakers who went to meet with Liza Chan. And they discussed with her the witness meetings that were so heavily featured in the presentation tonight. And uh, they learned that at different points uh, in the discussion, her accent had been misunderstood and mistranslated. So it was her position that the defense lawyers were using an inaccurate version of what was said in order to impugn the credibility of the witnesses. And so we wondered for the group, what does this additional information about the use and misunderstanding of Chinese language and translation from Chinese language to English. Tell us about the Vincent Chin episode. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? I, uh, I see a hand raised, uh, Dorothy. Well, you know, I just I just wanted to mention two aspects of this portion of uh, this analysis that I just found so fascinating. I think that in a lot of ways, um, I, I have 16 years of prior experience as a prosecutor. And I think in a lot of ways, um, prosecutors are sometimes afraid. Um, they're afraid of, you know, they don't want to step in it. They don't want to be making any assumptions that a translation and interpretation was done correctly or incorrectly. Um, and so these issues, uh, the, the, the significance of it for me um, was not so much in getting granular in the details about whether she was misunderstood or mistranslated or whether assumptions were made about the transcript, but also as the opinion noted, uh, the prosecutors, the government conceded that it was improper not to allow impeachment. And so that's a very central issue that, you know, sometimes facts are messy. And while the prosecution may have had really important goals that they were trying to accomplish, um, you can't hide from the messiness of the world, the messiness of life. Um, and it, it's kind of shocking, I guess, in retrospect, you can think it might be a little shocking if the government's now conceding that that should have been allowed as impeachment. Maybe they shouldn't have objected so hard during the first trial and maybe that trial result would have stood um, so it's kind of a sobering thought to think that maybe in your vigorous zeal, you may end up creating a record that won't support a conviction. And that, you know, is that doesn't help, that doesn't, that doesn't show that you're accomplishing justice. Yeah, thank you. I think Therese May had her hand up. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um... I had a, <clears throat> something came to mind um, when I heard that comment. Um, and I can see how this can happen, especially when people um, have English as a second language. I have a, I had a client um, for a number of years. She's still alive, but she was actually a school teacher. And she told me something interesting. She told me that and if this can, I'm, I'm bringing this up because if, I don't know why she told me this, but um, she told me, she said, Teresa, I think I've hurt a lot of children who are minorities. And I asked her why, why did she say that? And she said, because, and, and this, is, this, this is what it brought to my mind anyway. She said, I thought because their voices are so much louder that they were being aggressive. 
And so I sent him to the principal's office for talking back. And she says now um, that I've been around more people that are African. She was talking specifically about people from the continent of Africa. I don't, and, and I don't know how many people have been around, but I was married to a, a Nigerian. And I remember the first time my mother came to my house for a holiday and they were in there all talking, but the way they talk is very animated and it's very loud. Their voices carry because they're very strong voice. And I remember my mother said, Trace, are they fighting? I'm like, no, that's just, <laughs> that's just how they speak, okay? And my mother's like, oh my God, they sound so aggressive. And um, this instructor, this person who was my client for many years, she told me, Trace, I thought the black kids were being aggressive. And so I sent them to the principal's office and she said, I did that a lot. And she said, what I'm realizing now is their voices are just louder. And so I could see how in a situation where a person has English as a second language, if a person can misconstrue the loudness of the voice and take that as aggression, I could see how this could easily um, translate to a situation where they hear a word and they think it's something other than what it ought to be. And I think there's a lesson in that for us, but also the thing that came to my mind is if she knew that, why didn't they bring that up at the trial? Like, did that come up during the trial on cross-examination or anything like that? Mm -hmm. so I have a, both a comment and a question. Okay. Well, yeah, thank you. I mean, this is, um, we obviously didn't hear the entirety of the trial record. Um, and. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, I think we heard the pertinent excerpts. I think we can take from this that, that it wasn't there um, in any detail. But listen, why don't we go on? I think uh, Natasha um, and Jeff have a question. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I think it was a very um, eye opening evening tonight for, for everyone involved. And um, I just wanted to speak to the, the the point of of translations that are accurate um i think it's so important to have these sort of services that speak to people who don't speak the primary language in in wherever they are whatever country whatever community it is um i remember the amanda knox trial in italy where she was um, interrogated for for numerous hours in italian and she was an exchange student. She wasn't, um, you know, born person. Italian wasn't her primary language. And, and then the whole trial was also conducted in Italian as well. So these language barriers are, are, are critical, I think, you know, um, and I, I used to be a criminal defense attorney. And I remember I would always request a translator and, and ask my client if if that was okay, because if there was a, any language barrier, I could not assist my client properly. And I wanted to do the best that I could. So I think having these in courts and having translators and, and you know, who are very like good at what they do is critical to, to a, an equal justice system. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Go ahead quick story about that um, in our office um, there was a I heard a story about there was a recent prosecution or investigation of uh, an Asian based gang international gang and there was a point of testimony that was translated um, it was a key testimony and uh, there was a government translator and there was a defense translator the government translator and it was Cantonese to English the government translator translated it as an extremely strong statement of culpability the defense translator <laughs> translated it as basically the most innocuous, innocent statement ever. And so the solution was the two investigate the two translators were asked to meet and confer and settle on um, the translation. And they settled on the defense translation. And it was a question of the tone that was used changed everything in Cantonese language. So fortunately, they got to the right answer. But it just shows that was just a year or two ago. It just shows how. Uh, fraught this area is with potential uh, misunderstanding. I would like to say something, please. Can All you right. hear me? Yes. And that is, you know, everything is about tonality. 
everything is about the way is it it's a rhythm it's an energy that we give to each other it's what we give to babies without babies even seeing our race our touch everything that we do to each other as human beings that is what's important i mean with with my company, Barclay, I'm going to promote it. Yes, we do have translators. Yes, we do do this. Yes, we do have a diverse um, staff. The whole point is forget who I work for. Forget all of that. It's the way we walk out of our doors and how we speak to someone and what we're listening to because we could be... Um, cited as, as, as being loud, being whatever, and, it's, and, and, and we're not. So it's always, always know what community you're stepping in and always be aware of what your tonality is and how you want it spoken back to you. So whatever you put out, understand if you stop quietly they might say well what are you saying you know or if you talk loudly they say well wait a minute everything that we do and how we do it it resonates right back think about it i'm not a dancer but i was raising tonight <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how about this as a question? Um, we, you saw the statistics there at the end of the presentation, the first part of the presentation. Uh, so why has violence against Asian Americans spiked in recent years in this country? And, and, and what can be done about it? And as a subset of that, let me just point out that the newspaper articles that we read from the 1870s and uh, many, uh, many of the events that we discussed, including Vincent Chin, there are these public displays of violence or statements about violence. And we're seeing more and more of that as well. What does that say about our social order that um, there is this brazenness of public violence or statements about violence uh, in the form of hate crimes against Asian Americans? I, I want to speak on that too. It's all about fear. It's all about fear. It's not just about, I know you want to specify Asian or a race, but it's about people. It can be against your neighbor. It's about fear. And if you feel you're bigger, if you feel you're better, then you're brazen. And that is where a lot of this comes from. I'm afraid, but you know what? If I'm tougher, I'm gonna make them more afraid. If they don't have more people and I have more people coming over, then I'm the boss. It's about being the boss, which makes absolutely no sense when you go see a cemetery. But that's a lot of what we do. Either we do it out of love or we do it out of fear. And that's what happens. It's not about our skin color because not all Asians um, have slanted eyes or look Asian. Not all blacks look a certain way. Not all whites look a certain way. Not all anybody looks a certain way. We do this because we want to control and we're afraid. And when you're afraid, it's fight or flight. That's what oh, I believe. Okay. All right. Let's thank you. Um, I see some hands are raised, so let's let's hear from some others as well. Um, I have Jeff and Natasha's hands are up next, and then Dorothy and then Richard. Um, so I, I've been giving a presentation um, for about two years now. It's called Diversity in Hollywood. And I have um, spoken numerous times to the effect that our media and our, our cinemas are portraying a lot of Asian people as um, destructive tropes. You know, they're like gang members, they're nerds, they're, they're the, the people that you can sort of um, 
like sex workers for women, they're effeminate for men. It, it's a lot of that and it's a long history of that as well. Um, there are anti-miscegenation laws dating way back in Hollywood from like 1932. And this sets like a base, a foundation for, for a lot of discrimination, I think, across the board for a lot of um, gender discrimination and racial discrimination. And it's perpetuated even today. There's a film that was nominated for best picture called Licorice Pizza. And in it, there are two scenes in there where there, it is set in the 70s. So the director defended it saying, this is typical for the 70s. But there is a man in there, who, a white man who is speaking to his wife, who is Japanese. She's not subtitled, she's speaking in Japanese and he speaks to her in an Asian accented English. And then it's just supposed to be funny, <laughs> I guess, you know? And that's the point I wanna make is that Asian Americans are, are considered the butt of the joke or it's, it's okay, these are destructive tropes, but it's okay, it's comedic. This, this, is, this is really how they are, you know? So I think we have to be more cognizant and more mindful of this too. And when we see this in the media and when we go to cinemas and we watch it on TV, we have to be aware of it and we have to speak up against it. And we have to tell each other that this is not okay. This is unacceptable. And so I think that has a lot to do with it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. We, we should all keep in mind that we're the consumers of media and the media empire out there is a profit-making empire. And so uh, we're responsible for feeding the empire uh, to the extent that we do that. But uh, okay, Dorothy, you're next. You know, this issue, I think it's, co it's complex. I mean, because I would not, I don't believe that there's only one cause to the uptick in anti-Asian violence. And I, I also don't think there's only one cause to bullying. Um, I agree that it can often be out of fear, but sometimes it's just hate. <laughs> um, so there, you know, we don't like to think about that. We would like to think that there's some other underlying trauma that causes someone to treat another human being in such a terrible way. But I, I think that an acknowledgement that there are multiple causes and it's not easy to put into a box, it makes it harder to find solutions, but it also makes it more of a constructive discussion to have as to what's going on how do we have a multi-pronged approach to address it? Um, if you believe that um, there are you know, certain leaders in the country who are making it permissive to express what might've hitherto been hidden biases that are now it's acceptable to say them out loud. That's a th one theory that people have, that people feel empowered and emboldened by it. Um, other theories are that there's this fear that you know Asians are the cause of coronavirus, um, and that's due to ignorance. You know, so because there's such varying causes, I think it's difficult for us to try to pin down why a particular person might engage in an act that qualifies as a hate crime or as a hate incident. And so, you know, it's kind of like with anything else, we we can't read someone else's mind. Um, so maybe it's constructive to try not to read their mind, but to focus on, is there harm to someone that's happening? What's the impact? I'm less concerned about the intent at this point because I sometimes I feel like, well, a racist person is not gonna hear me when I explain to them why they're being racist. Most of the time, it's just met with defensiveness. Let's talk about impact on the person affected. Let's talk about whether there's a way to support folks who have experienced uh, these things um, and try to find a way to be constructive and and um, helpful from that end. I think that that's one way that helps me with my own fatigue, honestly, because this has been years with my own fatigue about the relentlessness of this issue as it's been coming up. And so, you know, that's that's one thing. If it's helpful to any of you, I would commend to you uh, to try to see if that approach works for you because. At the base of it all, you know, we see a lot of injustice in, in the type of work that we do. Um, and we have to be careful not to burn ourselves out. And we have to try to stay productive and positive um, in trying to make the world a better place, I think. I mean, the fact that you're here in this presentation tells us that you care. So I would just, you know, wanted to add that to the discussion. Yeah, agreed. I think we, every day in our 
everyday lives, we have little moments where we can be paying attention and show appropriate curiosity and interest in someone or something. And I, you know, I wonder how many of us are really present for those moments. And a little step in that direction can make a huge difference uh, over time. So it's, it's the little decisions that we make along the way, um, I think can really make a difference. All right, uh, Richard has his hand up, the floor is yours. But you're muted, we can't hear you. Probably heard me without the microphone, but in any event, no, I not really enjoyed the, uh, the conversations uh, about these various topics. Um, just as a, as a person who's old enough now to see the changes in, in, uh, in our society over time, um, I grew up at a time when, when it seemed to me I was raised by parents who said, you know, you can't justify things by, by looking at the ends. The ends don't justify the means. And some of the things that I see on TV and, and, uh, and uh, the media and everything else uh, does exactly that. Uh, if you're a superhero, uh, it doesn't make any difference if you break the law or cause all this damage or other things as long as you get the bad guys. Uh, if you're a, a bad cop, but you, you arrest the, uh, the person who you've seen three scenes before did the robbery, uh, oh, these technicalities about law and search and seizure, uh, you know, they really don't matter because we've, we've gotten the, the bad guy. And the, uh, the concern that I have is, is the basis of civilization, the basis of, of a more positive civilization is, uh, is understanding the importance of those rules and understanding that the ends don't justify the means. Uh, you really don't have a just society if you violate every rule of justice or, or every sense of, of what is right and wrong to, uh, to get a conviction or to prosecute someone unfairly. When it comes to, uh, to bias and prejudice, uh, I think the thing that we have to realize that, is that uh, we as human beings tend to identify who we are. Uh, so it was fairly easy for the German people in World War II to identify who the Jews were because we had names that were suggested of our, our, of our background. And to help with that, we were, we were required to wear yellow stars on our garments so you could, you could see who they were. And it was a crime to be a Jew and not wear those things. Uh, race in America has been the same way. We, we've always been described growing up as children as a melting pot. Well, what does that mean as a melting pot? Well, it means at some point in time, the whole thing is, is going to, uh, to turn into a, a uniform soup, I guess, and, and uh, uh, we won't have to worry about who is black and white or Asian or non-Asian or Indian or things of, of this sort. And, and I think the reality is that uh, it takes a higher civilization to, to put those things out of your mind. Uh, you're always going to, uh, to be um, somewhat suspicious of someone who doesn't look like you. Uh, and that's, that's just a very normal tribal reaction, I think, that all of us have. And the person before who's talking about mindfulness, you just have to be aware of that and try to control those tendencies. And, you know, you asked before, uh, how, can we, how can we do something about this? I think one of the things that happened in our lifetime was the acceptance, more of an acceptance of, of gays in our society and homosexuals and transsexuals. And Harvey Milk, when he was realizing how to, to uh, put down legislation that was going to, uh, to be harmful to gays, he said, listen, you, you have to come out of the closet and you have to show others uh, who you are and you're not a threat to them. And, uh, and you are a person to be trusted and believed like, like anyone else. And that particular really gutsy thing that, that, that Milk did at his time, I think is why there have been so many things that have progressed with, uh, with the, the gay and transsexual uh, community uh, because people now, now see them more, they, they, they aren't hiding in closets anymore, they're, they're, uh, they're openly um, showing their sexuality and, uh, and those of us who now see who they are, gosh, uh, yes, I can accept you now because you're still the same person you were the other day when I didn't know who you were. And those sorts of things are tough uh, but it's the sort of thing that measures a better civilization from a lesser civilization. And I think that's 
that's the challenge that's before us now. We have leaders like the last president. It doesn't make it any easier because uh, the sorts of things that he was doing was trying to develop the very biases and prejudices that we're trying to overcome. And, and everything he was saying, not just against Asian people, uh, but some of the things that he would do in press conferences. Uh, he was just four years of a bully and, and I hope I'm not offending anyone if, if they supported, supported the person, but that isn't, that isn't really the American way and that, that isn't the higher form of civilization I think that we, uh, we all shoot for. But those are the sort of things that I think would be necessary to sort of realize uh, what our, our natural trends are and sort of overcome those natural trends uh, becoming more civilized, more accepting, more understanding of people, and hopefully uh, being better people for it. All right. Yeah, thank you. You know, the, that whole question of sameness and differentness, differ, differentness is a very interesting one. I think um, in my own life, I've thought about, you know, the same, there are, there are aspects of humanity that uh, are common um, that I think are important to recognize. Um, and then there are the beautiful differences that we don't want to take away. I mean, the idea of diversity is we celebrate and hold up differences, and it makes us a stronger society that we're able to do that, rather than requiring everyone to homogenize into some dominant, uh, mostly white view of what it looks like. So there's that, that balance there between, yes, we have connections as, that are common humanity, but differences to celebrate too. I wanted to uh, just share with you, and then I'm gonna ask David Ratner if he's still with us a question. Um, and his voice isn't too sore from that uh, turn he took as the federal prosecutor. I'm um, here. Good, excellent. Uh, one, in my reading, I learned uh, that there was, in the first few years in San Francisco, there was an active and celebrated uh, community of Chinese immigrants. Uh, in 1850, when there was a cele uh, when there was a, a like a funeral march because President Taylor died, uh, they were given a prominent place at the head of the parade and enjoyed and celebrated. That turned very quickly uh, within a couple of years, and these laws that I was talking about started to get passed. And uh, there was a a Sa Sa uh, San Francisco resident who was quoted in the newspaper, wrote some letters to the editor. Um, and I don't have his name handy right now, but um, I think it was Asing. Yes, it was Asing. So when this question of who was uh, ethnically inferior began to be raised in the in the discussions and the newspapers, Asing wrote in a letter, and one of the points he made was, "quote that when your nation was a wilderness." and the nation from whom you sprung barbarous, we exercised most of the arts and virtues of civilized life, close quote. And there's several other points like that that he made in his writings. And this is a gentleman who was alive in the 1850s experiencing all the things that we've been talking about and made the point very clearly and succinctly that uh, we were not the civilized people um, with a higher form of civilization. Um, uh, it's, it's it's something to think about. Um, I want to ask David Ratner because uh, I understand that uh, in your in your long and illustrious career as a trial lawyer, uh, one of the things that you have done is you have represented laborers from China who uh, worked in this country in conditions that could be described as deplorable. I, I would like for you, if you didn't mind, take a few minutes and just tell us what that work was like. So uh, the career has been long. I don't know how illustrious it's been, um, but uh, most of it was in New York. And um, a, lot, a lot of my work in New York was uh, the plaintiff's personal injury work. And um, many of the clients I represented were undocumented Chinese workers who worked in construction. And, and these were um, but by and large from uh, Fujian, Fuji, Fujianese speaking Chinese uh, uh, folks. 
and um, the men would come here. Um, they would live uh, in Chinatown, and New York has several Chinatowns in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, in, in Queens. They'd live in um, deplorable conditions, uh, uh, single room occupancy uh, hotels, or, or in rooming houses, or in apartments that have broken up, uh, or in single rooms where they would share 10 uh, to a room. And, and they would work um, in construction gangs that would be uh, headed by a boss who uh, would pick these guys up at a shape up, bring them to a job site. They would work the job site and um, uh, the construction company, and these were not uh, small construction uh, projects. These were uh, six, eight story apartment buildings, commercial buildings, things like that. And, and the uh, con general contractor would pay the boss who would then skim off the top and, and pay the workers uh, in cash uh, who would keep part of it and send part of it back to family in China. Um, what made these cases worth pursuing was the New York uh, labor law, which uh, protected construction workers, whether they were documented or not, whether they were paid in cash or not. Um, that would make both the owner and the general contractor absolutely liable for any type of injury where where a worker either fell from a height or something from a height fell on the worker. Um, and that formed uh, a, a good part of my practice for a number of years. Um, and, and but the uh, conditions in which these folks lived um, probably did not vary much from the 1850s, 1860s uh, here on the West Coast. Thank you. Um, I want to catch up with someone who had their hand up, uh, but then it came down. I didn't see it in time. I just want to make sure if you've got a question that we'd like to hear from you. It's Daphne Gallagher. Hello. Hi. Um, no, I was just another incident. I was quite interested in that, what you told about Antioch. I'd only recently heard that from my son, who was a um, history major at Berkeley and has been working on as a student teacher. And uh, he told me about that. I had never heard about that before a few months ago. Another interesting um, and evidence of uh, ra historical racism was, and I don't know if anyone had heard about this, that, and I was just checking it because I forgot the details. I saw it on PBS a while ago, the, um, a, a plague outbreak in San Francisco around 1900, and they quarantined all, it, it, it sort of was, I, mean, I think they were rerunning it because of all the problems with um, COVID and uh, quarantined all the area of Chinatown, starting out with actually officially quarantining persons of Chinese extraction. And later they, because of a federal court, they had to change it to the, the dimensions of Chinatown. But it ended up being the downfall of a, gov a former governor, Henry Gage. Kind of interesting history if you're into that sort of old, old stuff. Yeah. Well, I, 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 am, I think it is interesting because it does, um, echo to today's time, as you as you mentioned, uh, sort of the, the near hysteria that we found ourselves in um, over yeah. COVID-19. And at times it was hysteria, justifiably so, because we, didn't, we weren't sure whether the world was coming to an end. And ginned um, up by some national figures to sort of just, I don't know, set a match to that sort of, um, you know, racism within 
within our own population. And uh, yeah, the, the the cycle that, as I see it, uh, the cycle is um, there is some uh, turbulence or trouble that that appears. It could be economic, like the Panic of eighteen seventy three, or uh, it could be just the uncertainty of this, you know, illness and where it's going and what it's doing. And in that um, uncertainty and fear, people that want to acquire and hold power come in and exploit. Um, what is already there, um, uh, this idea that people who are different than me are something that I need to be upset about and have strong feelings about, unfortunately. So I think the more we can um, you know, be aware uh, of these historical events, the better the chance that we could have a more broadly well-informed society that would act as a check on that, but it, it is challenging. Uh, we like to think that we're as educated and civilized at, at this point as we ever have been. And yet, I agree with the speaker who said the last few years have really tested that. We've got, you know, 342% more uh, incidents of hate crime against Asian Americans. By the way, the hate crimes went up in every category against every, against every uh, category of racial ethnicity, but more so against Asian Americans. So maybe double against other groups, but triple and uh, almost quadrupling against Asian Americans. So um, very sobering, very sobering to see the cycle repeat. Um, all right, any, any other questions or observations out there? I think uh, we really appreciate everyone's time and attention and uh, wanna thank all of the um, folks who volunteered to play roles. Um, actually, I think it was Mika Domingo who saw this um, performed at a, it was Mika. Mika saw this at a convention in DC. I believe it was Napaba and came back and said, you know, this would be a really worthwhile program. And then we took it from there. So thank you, Mika, for that uh, inspiration. Oh, a hand is raised. Uh, D. Rosario. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, uh, this is a great conversation. Um, the question for me is, if this trial, if the, if the Vincent Chin trial would have, would have happened today, would, would the outcome be different? Well, I would have to ponder that a little bit. I would say that the uh, the defense cross-examination of the witness preparation uh, sessions is something that I think you would see in a courtroom every day, um, you know, in this country, every day, all over the place, if that happened. Um, I agree with Dorothy's observation that the prosecution should have embraced those facts and uh, had a presentation that harmonized that reality um, rather than to try to steal some of that thunder, you know, to try, and actually to make it, to explain what actually happened in a way that could still let the jury find him guilty. But even allowing for that, even allowing for the deficiencies in the prosecution, I think that, uh, that I think you would see that repeated. Um, I think it's still the case that, uh, you know, a, a jury in Cincinnati is going to react differently than a jury in Detroit. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I want to say that it wouldn't happen the same way, but I think that there's some arguments that would suggest that it would. Um, well, I, I, I mean, look at Ar Armand Aubrey trial. The, 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 the difference, uh, I think, is a couple of things. Number one, um, I think uh, the prosecutors now are, are more sensitive uh, to what you need to do to, to prove a hate crime and, and or, or to prove the motivation. But number two, there'd be 30 cell phone videos today that, that, that just didn't exist back then. And, and so you're going to have more than just eyewitness testimony. You're going to have a visual record. Uh, of what occurred. Um, 
So uh, I, I think uh, the, the prosecution in Cincinnati or in Detroit could get a conviction uh, on these facts um, re relatively easily. Yeah, I just wanted to add something about, I thought about that as well. It's nice to see you, Dee, by the way. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, I, I think about it and I have to remember that what we're talking about um, when we discuss the trial is the actual hate crimes trial. And the, um, the, the murder of Ahmaud Arbery was actually the state action. It was not a hate crimes action. They did not do the hate crime enhancement. The prosecutor made a strategic decision to try it as a straight murder case. And it was very interesting because even though there was a lot of potential ammunition of racial animus based on the investigation that was ultimately done, um, they did not push heavily on that. They, you know, I think that that turned out to be a, a really important strategic decision. And the, um, the, the result of that state verdict impacted the federal actions in that you know, much as with, you know, the, the, the trial over the murder of George Floyd, because Derek Chauvin was convicted in the state trial, he ended up pleading, I believe, in the federal charges. Um, and that result does tend to follow, um, you know, how the state case, how the state court case went can oftentimes change uh, what's going to be a strategy in, on the federal level. And so, What's very interesting about this one is, you know, we understand that that initial uh, federal trial might have had some more permutations, some more, you know, wrinkles and things like that. Um, but in the end, um, it's whether you feel like a, a properly impaneled jury can really make um, the decision, um, has, is the proof sufficient? And, you know, I think over the years, as much as we've seen many verdicts that we all may individually disagree with and think are um, problematic um, and, and, and fear that things were going on that were not necessarily revealed, um, you know, people's private motivations or things like that. Overall, the, the jury verdict, the jury system um, is something that, you know, although people need to be cognizant that it's not perfect, um, it's better than a lot of other systems out there, right? So that's one, one place where I try to find some hope in that, um, that as much as we've seen, and, and, and in the Vincent Chin case, a lot of the injustices we're talking about were not so much with the trial system part of it, but with the sentencing part of it, which is a lot, it's something that people don't think about a lot. Certainly back then, no prosecutors at the sentencing, that sounds like completely foreign to folks like me who, you know, I graduated from law school in 1999. Um, and so, you know, I, my, my legal career has been in this century. And, you know, the idea of a prosecutor not being present, not doing a victim impact statement, not having that perspective and that information to give to the court making the decision, it seems horrifying. So to the extent that things have changed, I think that would have changed the state sentencing if a prosecutor had been present, if the victim had a chance, if the victim's family had a chance to make a victim impact statement, those are things that developments that have happened that I think have uh, led to a positive change in you know people's pursuit of justice. I remember, yeah, Judge Kaufman uh, in the same interview commented that uh, you know the number of sentencing hearings in a week was burdensome. I think it was. I think we said five a day. You know. Um, it was 10 a day, 50 a week, 2000 a year, you know, it's a lot of work. So, you know, that was, that was his understanding of the system. And that is much different today. I think individual, uh, at least in the, I can speak to the federal system An individual sentencing hearing takes as long as it needs to take. And I've been in them that have taken three hours. Uh, so uh, that is a difference, I agree. All right, uh, Richard has a question. Or well, I, was, I was a prosecutor also, and, and uh, I think what Dorothy said originally was, was more of the accurate situation, that, that um, this case was a travesty, not because there was a not guilty on the, uh, the, racial, the racial aspect of the, uh, the crime. This, this case was a travesty because the DA, this wasn't, this wasn't a, 
uh, a sentencing decision the judge was making. This was, this was a plea bargain. And the DA who entered the plea bargain uh, knocked it down to a voluntary manslaughter. If I, if I heard the, uh, the narrative correctly, knocked it down to a voluntary manslaughter. And usually you would do that to, uh, to number, number one, your sentencing options are reduced as a judge. And number two, there might have also been a sentence agreed to. Um, and your, your record doesn't indicate one way or another uh, uh, whether or not that was true. But I think the thing that is, is different today, not that the, the federal trial would come out differently, because I think it was really a, um, it wasn't the best of, of trials to show uh, racial animus. It was the best of trials to show a very um, heinous murder. Uh, but I think the, the difference is what Dorothy hinted at, that prosecutors today are going to be more sensitive to those sorts of things. They aren't going to be willing to give in to the, uh, uh, what used to be the South. Oh, this was just uh, one of these uh, people from, from Chinatown who was, who was being, uh, being beaten by a, an out of work auto worker. I'm, you know, that sort of mentality uh, did permeate through, uh, through DA's offices, especially I think in, in the East, I haven't seen it as much in the West as I have in the East. I think the difference is that, that those sorts of things by prosecutors, I think, have changed. And I think they would accept this, as, as, as Dorothy said about the, uh, the trial in, uh, just recently. Uh, it was better for the state to, to prosecute that case strictly as a, a murder case rather than a racially motivated murder and leave, leave the racially motivated stuff after they had the murder conviction uh, to the federal government. It just worked out better. Uh, but I think that would be the, the difference that, that it wouldn't have gotten to the manslaughter stage uh, by anyone's imagination today. That would be the difference. One thing I was going to add, uh, there was a reference to the civil proceedings. So uh, there was a civil case, actually two cases, one against Nitz, one against Evans. And uh, Nitz agreed to pay $50,000 in settlement. I think he paid uh, $50 a month or something like that um, toward that settlement. The Evans uh, settlement was for $1.5 million. And then he uh, moved to Nevada uh, to enable him to shield uh, his assets somewhat from collection. And I think it was um, Helen Zia and Liza Chan helped uh, to, or well, particularly Liza Chan as the attorney, helped to perfect that judgment and keep it in place. And there were several times that Evans uh, tried to get out from under the judgment and they kept it in place. Interest kept to accrue. And the last figure I heard was that it's up to like $8 million uh, that he continues to owe on that judgment. Um, that was a, I heard that in a podcast uh, last year. So it's not a it's sort of current last year. How much has been collected? He did pay, he was supposed to pay 250 a month or 25% of his income, whichever was uh, greater. And he paid, he made some payments initially. I don't have an exact figure, but I think it's like a handful of thousands of dollars or less. So he's still alive. Um, and the judgment is still out there. <laughs> that's my understanding, yes. And he has no property to pay the judgment on, so it's it's something you can pay for your wall with, but it isn't it isn't very meaningful to the victims, I think. Well, he, I mean, he he moved to Nevada in order to um, prevent any meaningful payment. It's my understanding. I don't know what he did with his assets, but once he was in Nevada with his assets, um, I think the laws there are very protective of of that. All right, it's uh, 7.30. I think we told you this would be uh, 5 to 6.30, so we're an hour past our time. Uh, clearly, there's a great deal of interest in this chapter of history, and uh, we thank you so much for, for joining us tonight, and keep an eye out for future programs. Um, I do think that the Exclusion Acts could be a whole program by themselves, um, but uh, we'll see down the road. Uh, we'll talk as a committee and we'll try to come up with another good program or two for you to enjoy. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, good night. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you, especially Jonathan and all of our presenters for all of your hard work today. <laughs>